right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Jody Hume, who is in Baltimore, Maryland. How are you doing, Jody? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Jody is a personal strategist and facilitator for busy leaders and their teams. And what we're going to talk about today is something that I think is really going to hit home <laughs> for a lot of people, given the situation that we're in today, and that is um, decision fatigue and energy management. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I guarantee you there's a lot of people who are going to listen to this or watch this and sort of say, yeah, making decisions is really hard right now, or we're struggling yeah. as a company making decisions, or I'm struggling to make decisions. And so, um, first of all, Jody, what is decision fatigue? Right. So, so I think we all experience decision fatigue. I don't know that we're all aware that we experience decision mm. fatigue because I don't think you realize that decisions actually take a lot of effort. <laughs> I mean, I think I, I should, I should be specific about that. Mm. Obviously we all know that or we're aware that there are certain decisions that feel like hard decisions. I don't know mm. that you really understand what it takes your brain and what part of your brain you need to make decisions. And, and let's be honest, I mean, dis decision fatigue, was something that I talked about long before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty certain that I heard from every single client I have ever had in March and April of this year <laughs> because <laughs> everyone was having to make decisions that no one has ever made before. You know, no one has had to figure out when is what's the Goldilocks moment to shut your office down and send the people home. You know, nobody wants to be that person who you know, thought the sky was falling and sent everyone home and then it was nothing. But you also don't want to be that person who waited too long. And th the interesting thing is it has, you know, it just really brought to the surface something that is so true about leadership in general, which is there isn't a map a lot of times. No. I think we feel like there are maps because you can read a blog post and look up best practices, but that doesn't mean it works for you. We've always needed orienting skills. And now everyone really, really feels that because there's a map. So but back to your question, I won't, I won't totally geek out on the neuroscience, but decisions, the very front, you know, the prefrontal cortex of your brain is the part that is needed for all the really nuanced thinking, the, the, the really smart, you know, parsing through conflated information and decision-making skills, which goes all the way down to if you wake up in the morning and you look at your, your phone and you're deciding with emails like, yes, 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 no, no, that counts as a decision. And what's important, and I think what we don't always realize, that part of your brain uses way more fuel faster than the parts that are more automated or even your fight or flight brain really. And you can blow through that glucose really quickly. Like you have to jealously protect that because when it gets low, when you get run down, that's when indecision and spinning wheels. And you know, I've had clients sometimes call to talk through a decision and honest to goodness, John, if I said, do you want a hamburger or cheeseburger? I don't think they'd be able to even make a decision because they're so tired and so exhausted. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think, I, I mean, I, I love what you said, because I think people do underestimate the, the mental uh, energy that it does take to make decisions. And, and it's like, I mean, you know, as humans, I mean, as you just said to neuroscience, we're, you know, in many ways we're, we're hardwired to not want to make decisions because mm -hmm. because as i always say when you make a decision you know you're making a choice which means you're unchoosing other things right and that and we just don't <laughs> like to do that we don't no. like to unchoose and close doors <laughs> <laughs> i like that phrase unchoose i'm gonna i'm gonna use that going forward yeah it's that fear of missing out fear of mm -hmm. all of that though is is really based on this flawed perception of how the world works i, I think mm -hmm. so many things we imagine um, you know, those, those water slides at the park where you climb like 87 <laughs> stairways and then you get to the top and there's a blue one and a green one and you have yeah. one choice and you get in and then like your entire, it all happens and it dumps you out. I think people think of decisions that way. Like I'm going to make mm -hmm. a choice and then I'm going to swoosh through the rest of my life and end up at the end. And that's just not what happens. You, mm -hmm. you, you make a choice, you walk through a door and immediately the entire landscape changes and now you have different decisions and new things to consider. And not to say there aren't wrong choices or bad choices, sure. for sure, but they're not, they're, they're never the last choice you get to make. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, and then the time you spend hanging out there can be really down, but mm -hmm. we are having to make 
so many more decisions with, with less information, conflicting information, and then add in that layer where it feels like a lot of them are, not to be dramatic, kind of life or death situations, you know, just deciding, can my kids go play in the backyard with another kid? That was never a life and death yeah, decision before. <laughs> so it's just, and our brains aren't wired for that. We're wired no. to like hype into gear for a short sprint. Mm. We are not wired to do this this long. <laughs> yeah, no, it, we're, we're not. And it, it is, and I think that is what you just touched on there is the making decisions with less information, with less, with absolute lack of certainty in any, in any uh, area right now is, I mean, it is tough. It's difficult. But I think also, you know, paralysis is even worse. I mean, you have oh, to is. make some decisions and you have to move forward. And sometimes you just, sometimes you have to take a leap of faith and, and say, okay, gathering all the best pieces of information I have, it's not a lot of it, but I think this is the way we got to go. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, is a couple of things. Um, I, we say leap of faith or trust that you can do mm -hmm. it. We are so much more adaptable than, than we realize. And just yeah. any kind of taking action is so valuable. And what's funny, it's another place that I think we're really flawed in, in how we imagine how things work. Because I think we imagine that, um, that by not making a decision, it is somehow safer. Yeah. Something, it's almost like a glitch in the human operating yeah. system that we imagine that, that, well, I just won't make a choice and I'll just wait and see what happens as if that doesn't come with risks. Mm. And, and, as if, and as if that's not a choice. Right, right, right. It feels like a non-choice, but it's not a non-choice. <laughs> and I, it's, it's one thing that I have people do sometimes when they're feeling that way is we're really good at identity. And your, your brain is wired for this just from an evolutionary standpoint. You're really good at kind of itemizing the risks of any choice you're thinking about having. Somehow we don't take that moment to itemize the risks of just hanging out in this like mm -hmm. neutral zone a little longer. Yeah. But I, it's fascinating if you actually make someone do that or make yourself do it. And then you look at them, you're like, Oh, Oh, actually <laughs> this hanging out right here part is, is kind of terrible. It's really mm -hmm. awful. So. Yeah. So it's, so I do think it's, um, it's time obviously for people, they have to break out of this. They have to start making some decisions, but as you said, you know, they, I mean, people are feeling drained of energy, they're fatigued, they're worn out. This has gone on so much longer than, I mean, remember back when all this started? I mean, we were thinking two weeks, maybe a month, whatever. You kind know, of felt like then, an extended snow day, you know? Yeah, an extended <laughs> snow day that turned into, uh, I don't know, turned into a glacier. You know? Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Um, so how do you how do you manage energy and how do you replenish energy and how do you get yourself into a position to be able to make these decisions and kind of forge forward despite the uncertainties? Yeah, um, this this sounds like squishy advice, but it is the hardest that I have to get my clients to follow, and it's only the most courageous who do, mm -hmm. which is which is taking time off. I, I jokingly call it strategic hooky, um, <laughs> strategically <laughs> playing hooky. And, and it's really interesting. I mean, I struggle with this too, because when you are overwhelmed or feeling underwater, the last thing it feels like you can possibly do is take a break or, or even, I mean, forget, take a break, even mm -hmm. pause long enough just to like straighten up your desk or make a list of what's most important. Like when it, when you feel that underwater, mm -hmm. I, if I had one magic wand to happen in the world, it would just be trust that the most strategic and important thing you can do, especially if you're a leader. It's true if you're just any person in the world, but if you lead other people, the degree to which you are clear and able to make decisions is, is the maximum that anybody in your organization is going to be able to be clear. And so taking that time to be clear. And what's really fascinating, last week, I feel like I almost accidentally did my own little scientific research study on this. <laughs> we had been gone a week uh, for vacation. Didn't quite fill, I mean, it, was, it wasn't even really a vacation. Didn't fill me back up again. I came back, I did one day of work on Monday, was just feeling really sloggy. On Tuesday, a friend asked me to go for a hike. And of course, my immediate thought was like, I can't take a half day and go for a yeah. hike. I just got back from a quasi vacation. Mm -hmm. But I went, cause it was the only, it was like the one nice day it was gonna rain for like two weeks. I went and here's the fascinating thing. It was a three hour hike. I love to take pictures. I take pictures mm -hmm. compulsively, especially like na cool nature things and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. When I got home, I knew that I felt better. I did. But 
I looked at my camera roll and it was almost like a documentation of this wadded up piece of paper of my brain, like mm -hmm. unfolding back into itself. Because in the first half of the hike, I took two pictures and hysterically, I didn't feel this way at the time, but they look like obligatory snap a pic of the forest kind of. Uh -huh. It's like, and trees, yeah. big deal, you yeah. know, like, and whatever. <laughs> two pictures, the first hour and a half. Starting around the midway point, I started taking more pictures. And in the last like half an hour, 40 minutes of the, of the hike, I took like 60 of the coolest, most interesting, just gorgeous pictures that I love. And I got home and for the next several days, my creativity, my productivity, my energy, my decision-making skills were just, they were sharpened and it was so noticeable. And it's like, I watched it happen on my camera roll. <laughs> so, yeah. No, but I, but I think there's a, there's an important lesson there, though, I do think is that, and especially now is, I think you have to lift your head up and look around a little bit. And because of all the, all the terrible things and the strike, all the stuff that's going on is you somehow, somehow, like you did with your nature work, you somehow have to look at, take a look around and see some simplicity and beauty in life and get yourself centered again and try to, you know, flush some of this craziness that's uh, been, in, you know, being put into your head by all the stuff that's going on. Whatever flushes your craziness, like mm -hmm. even introverts are struggling right now. Mm -hmm. Early on, introverts were like, works for me. This is great. Yeah. I don't have to go see people. Uh, my husband is a huge introvert and I insisted that I was like, you have to find some things that bring you some joy. You, I could just mm -hmm. see it on him. He's not doing, getting to do the things that he would normally like to do. And most of us can't do a lot of the things that fill our tanks back up because they're just not available. And mm -hmm. so if you are feeling like depleted or just kind of bummed out or, or we don't even have like things to look forward to. I, I don't know that anyone underestimates under, I don't think anyone really understood how much we rely on the energy that comes from having things to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a lot of those right now. So it is just really turned up the volume on the necessity to anything you know that gives you energy, regardless of how indulgent or silly it <laughs> seems to take time to do it. If you have access to it, do it. You will reap the rewards. The ROI, I guarantee you will be there. So whether it's playing music or or going out into the woods or whatever it is. Or um, going out into the woods and playing music. Yeah. Oh, that's really <laughs> lovely. I, I, I can, I'll sign up for that today. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, to, but to your point, I think if we don't do that, um, because I mean, we're not underestimating that many of the decisions you have to make are are tough ones and are ones that have ramifications and, and you know potential ramifications that you know it's impossible to see at this point. Yeah. So you want to you want to be at peak energy when you're making those kind of decisions. Yeah. Well, it, to me, if you really think about it, you can look at. I mean, the science is not in dispute about this. There isn't a mm -hmm. single high performing thing out there, whether it's the Olympics or violin players or you know, all of the top notch level of all of those things strategically incorporate a lot of rest, more than you can possibly ever imagine. And if you like these things that we're having to do are like the Olympic level decisions that we're normally, that compared to our normal decisions, Nobody, no Olympic athlete goes into the Olympics with the plan of, well, the 10 days leading up to the Olympics, I'm going to train really hard, like 10 mm -hmm. hours a day. And then during the Olympics, I'm really going to spend my extra time at the gym training and exhausting my muscles. That is never the plan. <laughs> no <laughs> one suggests that. And it's because all of the science supports the value when it comes to both physical things and mental things of the white space of that mm -hmm. like space between things where you can renew and, and get your energy back and then it will show up. But, and it takes a little bit of trust, but I just encourage, if that feels hard, it's hard for a lot of people to just find little ways, even, even um, just stepping away and taking, and I've, I've started going to sit on my front porch when I feel a right. little like, g -g 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 -g. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because that's another thing. We're not also not designed to stare at a, uh, a screen all day long. Mm -hmm. There's there's all sorts of reasons that Zoom and whatnot is just extra, extra exhausting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and that, that's what I'm saying is I just find some simple things to start with, you know, that can just take you out of, as you said, take you out of the moment, whether it's sitting on your porch or whatever, but find those things because it is, it is incredibly hard. 
here's a tiny one. Just if, if a call doesn't have to be a video call, even if it is a video call, but you don't mm -hmm. need to be on the video call, if you can do it on your phone and it's a nice day out, go sit on your front porch and do the call from out there, you know, assuming there's not leaf blowers and whatnot. Yeah. That is a tiny, tiny little thing that most, you know, a lot of people can do. It can be that small. Um, mm. Just little tiny things can actually build. You have to test for what, what, you know, what, what, what fills your tank back up, yeah. but it isn't uh, it's not a math formula that you can just keep taking and taking and taking from the tank. Yeah. It doesn't work. No, no, absolutely. And I think, and I mean, that's the point is too, is that if you're making decisions from a point of depleted energy, from a point of chaos or whatever, you know, chances are they're not going to be good decisions and, nope. and you're, <laughs> And, and if other people are relying on you, I mean, the same thing, if other people, if, if, you're, if your decision-making process is, is a collective decision-making process, right, there's a lot of other people involved, then obviously you also have to make sure that they are in a good space to give their input too. Yeah, and, and the real risk is, because like I said, I, it's not that I don't think there are bad decisions. I think there are far mm -hmm. fewer bad I, I think our fear of bad decisions is is out is oversized because mm -hmm. even like not the greatest decision you can then recover from it i think yeah. the real risk to being depleted and exhausted is indecision and mm -hmm. paralysis and just not doing anything if you're not if you don't have some amount of certainty and this just isn't a time when certainty is a thing that we can use as a stepping stone to get to the next place and that's easier for some people than others, but it is going to be even harder if you yeah. don't have that energetic capital, as I think yeah. of it. You know, everyone, everyone knows how important financial capital is in your, in your company. Energetic capital is every bit as important. Yeah. And, and to your point there, I mean, I think it's, um, it's the point is that uh, if you if you make those decisions, if you make them well, if you make them with energy, and you continue to operate with some energy, if, the, if it's a bad decision, you can change it pretty quickly, yep. right? As opposed to if you're, if you're depleted and you make a bad decision, you may stick with it a little bit longer. Yeah, and, <laughs> and this is definitely just a time where we really get to learn how often you're really rolling the dice. <laughs> yeah. You have to make a decision and you're like, I don't know, I guess, I guess it's the least bad decision, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, we've seen across the whole world, I mean, we've seen like so many experts be wrong about everything. So, I mean, it's like, so, hey, it, you know, it's, you're, you're probably just as well positioned in your own business to make dis good decisions as a lot of other people are. Yeah, I think that's the really funny thing. Like leadership, I don't know where along the path that leading got conflated with like knowing and being mm -hmm. right. Leadership yeah. by definition is forging into a place where no one is ahead of you. Otherwise, you're following. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, by definition, it is a gamble roll of the dice. And mm -hmm. there's that there's that sort of parable story about someone following someone else's um, uh, taillights and they follow them, follow them and crash into them. Like, what were you doing? They're like, I'm in my garage. <laughs> yeah. and, like when you're following other people, you can follow other people's guidelines, but, but every business and every person has their own things. And if you're not, and, and to choose by your own things is inherently tied to choosing with uncertainty. So if you're forging a new path, you have to get more comfortable with uncertainty. The gorgeous thing about it is though, the best way to do that is just continually make tiny decisions so that you can build that confidence in the fact that the decisions don't have to be, I'm making air quotes, right, exactly. Yeah. It's just make a decision, take an action, and then navigate. It's, it's incremental navigation. Oh, which by the way, I just heard something not too long ago. And I have validated this with an actual rocket scientist. Mm -hmm. Apparently the space shuttle is never, ever, ever on track. Ah. The only way they can get anything in space to where it needs to go is to constantly course correct mm. it. So they it to the left and then it to the right. And it just keeps going. It's never, ever, ever on track. Because the minute wow. they course correct it, it is inherently then off course. And they just have to decide how long until they course correct it the other way. 
So wow, that's good a, enough for NASA. I, yeah, if it's good <laughs> enough for NASA, if we can get people to space and back, then it's good enough for the rest. But I, I think that's a beautiful analogy to end on because, you know, yeah, you that's the thing about decisions aren't something that you make and then it's a straight line after that. I mean, you right. have to constantly as you say, course correct. And there's so many variables come into play, but it's, it's, you got to put that one foot in front of the other and get started. Yep. Well, listen, Jody, this has been, this has been fantastic. Uh, uh, all of Jody's information will be in the, in the bio below the video here, but please, before we go, tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company. Sure. Um, so I, I spent, after spending 17 years with an architecture firm running everything, they just wanted to be architects. So I did the rest of it. <laughs> so I was their COO. I started a company doing facilitation and originally coaching. And now I have over the years, as I worked with more and more business leaders, I decided they didn't need that as much. They really needed decision support on call as things were happening. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the sum, the sum of what I do now is that and round tables. Um, so, and then I also have a podcast uh, where we tell business stories and then, uh, and then glean some insights from them. So, Fantastic. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline CRM. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jody. And I'll Thanks see you for off another me. expert interview really soon. Thank you.